relationships with your loved ones. Once you start there, Guys, so you guys saw that amazing video, and Worlds is uh, in the house today. We have the CEO and co-founder of Worlds, Ampatau, Roman Sunder. Could you please come up? <laughs> and then next, we also have the business leaders in the house. Uh, Ryan Cummins, a CEO and co-founder of Omaze. Can you please join us on stage? And then our moderator today, Shannon Pruitt, the former CMO of The Honest Company. Can we get a round of applause? Yeah. And um, uh, thanks for watching that. <laughs> uh, uh, Thomas and Justin, thank you guys. Great job on putting this event on. I came to uh, your guys' event, I think, a couple months ago. And you guys had some rock stars here. And I was looking around. You guys are obviously rock stars. Uh, here today also. And by the way, just being here on a Saturday, give yourselves a big round of applause. <laughs> There's a lot of other shit you guys could have been doing, so that's cool. <laughs> um, and as you saw, Worlds was really created for the dreamers, the innovators, the hustlers, uh, people that are, who here wants to change the world? Yeah, so it's created for people that want to change the world, so I'm really stoked that Ryan came and that Shannon came, so I'm gonna hand it over to Shannon. Hi, everybody. Um, so excited to be here today. It's so fun to be in a room full of entrepreneurs because you bring so much spirit and energy and passion for what you're doing. And I agree, being here on a Saturday is an amazing commitment. And so I'm super thrilled to be here with Roman and Ryan. Um, I admire and respect them both professionally, but also in the missions that they have chosen. Um, I also admire them very personally, not only in sort of how they are, but how they are to everyone around them. It's really spectacular. So um, I'm s uh, let's get started. So at Worlds, which I have personally been to, so I can speak to this, we always give the audience a chance to ask some questions in the spirit of Worlds, which is happening September 10th and 11th in Long Beach. Um, I'm going to ask these guys uh, some questions, and then we're going to open it up to the floor for some questions, um, and then we'll wrap it up. Um, so it's exciting to be an entrepreneur, um, but it also is filled with highs and lows. It is a journey, as they say. Um, oftentimes, in the wisdom of life, we learn that we learn more in the low times sometimes than we do in the high times. Um, we, I, I think the group and I would love to hear about a time, maybe a low time for you, both of you, and then how you really started your businesses. So, Roman, let's start with you. Um, okay. Uh, let's get real. <laughs> let's get real fast. Uh, that's uh, how we do. We have, we yeah, have, that's as time. bad. That video is as bad as shiny of a life yeah. I've ever seen. And it's called a sizzle for a reason. <laughs> and we all kind of have that in our, in our lives. But uh, I've been an un I've started my first company when I was uh, 27 years old. And so I've been doing this for almost 20 years. And uh, my favorite quote is probably someone that's my biggest hero, which is Winston Churchill. And that is, success is going from failure to failure to failure without losing any enthusiasm. <laughs> and I think that's the commonality that Shannon and Ryan and a lot of the people that I know have, is that just like losing or having a setback or something going wrong is just one step closer to getting it right. So, and I think a lot of people didn't know, I didn't know that when I was 27. I was like, oh, like I failed, like I'm a failure. Like I'm so hard on myself. And so I'd say my kind of, uh, one of my biggest failures, because uh, there's been so many, so it was hard to think of one. Uh, but I remember it was uh, actually vivid in my mind because this is probably a really emotional moment for me, but it was um, January of 2011. And I was the CEO of another company and sole founder called Access 360. We built one of the largest media uh, networks. And um, I left that to start a new company called Mob Mobile. And we're going to reinvent the world of location-based. Location <laughs> right? It was holy grail of media, location-based. Uh, six months later, after investing like almost a million dollars of my own money, it failed. I didn't want to go out and ask my friends for money because that would have been an even bigger failure for myself. And I also had this Patel thing, uh, this passion project, 
and I decided not to do it. So I had quit my job that I had a, was the sole founder of, uh, of Venture Backed, all that stuff, started a company that failed, and my passion project was gone. And I remember sitting with my mom and my sister at Panini Grill off of Little Santa Monica, because they had cheap kebab. <laughs> and I was like, I've lost hope. And I don't know what to do. And uh, I think about that a lot. I, I don't want to say I think about it every day, because I try not to. <laughs> But it just comes to you sometimes. And um, there's a lot of things that happened in my life after that um, that uh, I obviously kept going. And if it wasn't for that lowest point, um, if you're living a mediocre, mediocre life uh, with no highs and lows, you're going to have a mediocre life. But what I found, and Ryan, you could speak to this maybe, is that the lower of a low that you have, the higher of a high that you'll have. Um. Yeah, that's a, that's a great note. Um, and it speaks to Roman, by the way, that he, you know, how many entrepreneurs that, that would you know that invest a million dollars of their own money and don't want to go to friends? Usually, it's the opposite. People like to take other people's money and don't want to put their own in, but that speaks to Roman's character that, uh, that, that he approached it that way. Um, I wasn't planning on sharing this one as the low, but I, I shared it with uh, Shannon and Roman backstage, so I, I guess I'll share this one. So a couple years into about four or five years into building Omaze, there was a weekend that I went on a little uh, a health retreat for my wife who has an autoimmune disease. And in that retreat weekend, um, I was going on it to sort of uh, see whether or not it'd be a worthwhile adventure for her and whether or not it'd, it'd have some modalities that could help her. And I realized in that weekend that one, I was so focused on business every single day that I was ignoring actually showing up for my wife in the way that I, that I most could to help her. And then on the second night, it really dawned on me that not only was I not focusing on her health, I wasn't focusing on my own health, that I was going to bed to emails and waking up to emails and only sleeping four hours a night. And I think that when we're talking about an entrepreneur's journey and when you guys are thinking about your entrepreneur's journey, it's very easy for us to think about our failures in a strictly business connotation. But a lot of times, in a more macro perspective, you know, we're all living our lives. While you guys are here, we're all, we're all trying to live our absolute best lives that we possibly can, and business is just one element of those lives. And, uh, and I talked to someone recently who said like, they don't like the term work-life balance because it pits work against life, and it really should be you know, work-life fit. And in that moment on that weekend, what I really realized was like my work-life fit was a little out of balance. And one other thing happened uh, sort of within that same week. My brother, who's six years older than me, has always been my best friend um, and like my idol, someone I looked up to, gave me a call. And he's like, hey, I'm really sorry to bother you. I know you're busy. And it just hit me in that moment to hear like a family member that you look up to say, I'm really sorry to bother you. And just that realization of like that should never happen in life. And so I think one of my biggest failures was recognizing in that process how much I had allowed the pursuit of business to actually overstep the pursuit of a balanced life and the enjoyment of life and recognizing um, what sort of dawned on me is like if I died right then and there, like I'd be really regretful of how I'd spent the last day, week, month, year. And so I really shifted a lot of stuff. So that was, that's what I'll say is one of my biggest failures. And I think it's interesting because <clears throat> both of you have sort of talked about how, like Roman, you were saying, like Patau was this passion project, right? That you were like, I'm done with that. I'm not going to do it. Um, and so many entrepreneurs, like their greatest business moments come from these things that are passion projects. Um, and it does find this intersection of your personal and professional development, right? Who are you and how do you translate to the world? And I think Worlds is a really interesting example of that. Having personally gone to Worlds myself, and I sent my team there um, several times, actually, because I uniquely had a prof very profound sort of personal moment where I did a writing workshop with NQ and was sitting next to the head of L'Oreal, <laughs> and we were sobbing and writing, and we came out later and we did a partnership. And not not after that workshop, because that would have been like extreme examples of vulnerability <laughs> and how that might cloud your thinking. But, you know, I, I, it was just such a powerful moment for me personally. Um, and I think I would love to hear from you guys, because 
oftentimes we do find that best intersection of ourselves and leadership and all of the, how do we get to be our best selves. What do you guys think um, in terms of what makes you sort of your best self, your best leader, your best human being? Um, and then how do you think about people and partnerships and networking sort of as part of that? Because in our business, oftentimes those things are seamless and often intertwined in a way that we can't separate them. How do you think about that? Ryan, let's start with you this time. Sure. So I'll take pieces of that. So I used to absolutely hate networking um, early on in my career in Hollywood. Uh, it was the worst thing in the world. I was really smack dab in entertainment, and all networking was was very quickly people trying to figure out whether or not you had done something or were doing something that could benefit them. That's how it felt. And so I always sort of felt like if I was telling my story to people of like who I was working with and what I was doing, like I'd already lost the game. And, uh, and then I left Hollywood for a year uh, to pursue, I'd, I'd been asked to be the first director on this thing called Live Earth, and it was the largest concert ever thrown, 150 music superstars around the world all on the same day. Great opportunity to sort of take part in something that had a global footprint. And on the heels of that, I really wanted to learn more about the world. And so I left LA and spent a year interviewing a couple hundred Nobel Prize winners, MacArthur Genius Grant recipients, Pulitzers, interesting thinkers. And after that, Networking got really easy for me, and the reason was is I shifted everything from trying to talk to people about who I was and what I was doing to talking about other people's ideas and what I found really interesting in the world. And then the other thing that came of that is as you share really big ideas that are taking place in the world, understanding what the people I was talking to valued and then seeing where I could offer value or create value in their lives based around these ideas rather than just trying to pit myself first and, and trying to understand like, all right, how do I get ahead? And that was a real big psychological shift for me. And so to this day, now I really still think about that in everything that I'm doing business-wise is really trying to think, all right, who are the people that I'm speaking with? What is it? Who are they? Where do they come from? What's their background? I always want to understand a person's origin story and then really get to the heart of where they're going primarily through trying to tease out their higher purpose. So not just what they want to accomplish, but why they want to accomplish it and what they really see as a better version of the world as a result of them doing whatever it is that they're seeking to do. And when you dig into that aspect of a human being, you forge those real connections. It's probably something that you guys were getting into when you were doing that in Q session, is really like being vulnerable, figuring out who you were as human beings, not you know who you were working for The Honest Company or who she was working for L'Oreal. It was like, who are we as people? And partnerships come out of that as a result. When people really put their titles aside and they put the business pursuits aside and they find out who they are as people and what the world is that they want to see, then a lot of beautiful things can happen. And so that's sort of been the shift for me is, I guess, to simplify understanding who a person is, what they're trying to accomplish, and how I can be of service to that. Roman, you have some experience in this. <laughs> um, God, I feel like I've changed so much in the last 10 years. Um, I'm, I'm a Russian immigrant Jewish guy, so I was... Bre how, how many people here from immigrant families? So I was instilled like the Russian version of a tiger mom. <laughs> I don't know what that's called, but I was raised with that. So it was very capitalistic. My first job was investment banking and my second job was hedge funds. And it was about what can I make? Like how much capital can I get out of this? And even with my startups up into my last one, I felt that way. And uh, then I saw, uh, it's like Maslow's hierarchy of needs. I think you start to when I started Patel especially, I saw something about, like you, you saw this probably when you're interviewing the Nobel laureates and all these iconic people. I started seeing the same thing when I had a chance to um, be become friendly with like a Quincy Jones or a Tony Hawk or a Kelly Slater or a Dalai Lama. And what I found is that they had three things that um, were commonalities. Number one, um, they had this you know, the, this lightning bolt of passion and obsession for who they were. Like who they were was what they did. Um, and two, they practiced irrational generosity. And they would do things that I saw for others that would get them nothing else in return and they never talked about themselves. And like you said, Ryan, that they took an interest in you. And so the biggest shift that I had in my life, and I practice this every day, um, I, um, I, I, uh, I, I, well, I meditate, so I wouldn't say it's you know prayer, meditation, whatever it is. And the three things that I meditate, I, th I think the secret in life is three things. One is love, two is generosity, and three is gratitude. 
And if you lead with those things, you're connected to a greater power, which is just humanity. And that's humanity is the only thing that we have here. The only certainty that we have is that we're on this tiny, fragile planet together. And so if we're taking, then the, the cosmic universe isn't aligned for our benefit. And so um, I think I shifted in that way too, where now I really lead, uh, and like Shannon, what you mentioned also, is like how, how do you kind of balance some of this, is um, I practice different types of meditation. I think anyone could, that wants to go surfing and go for a jog or wants to do a headspace or wants to do a transcendental thing, that's fine. But I know that I, when I start my day, I wanna be my best self to attract the greatest things in my life. Um, I recently got engaged, and I if it wasn't for, <laughs> and I'm 45, so it took me a while. <laughs> and uh, she's right there, Teresa. Um, and I feel like you know. And by the way, I think it, with uh, he had to hold a lot back yeah. by making this introduction to Teresa this late in the game. Yeah, exactly. That was 45 years well yeah. spent for the end result. Yeah. So. so I wouldn't. She's say pretty special, though. So let, we'll just say that. Yeah, and so I think the lesson of uh, is that to be able to attract, forget about work and attracting the next great deal or the next great, great job or the next great company, but just tr attracting the most love in your life through your relatives and through your loved ones, once you start there, and then once you're able to have that, then you'll attract those things in your job as well. And I think you have to lead with our spirits, like radical inclusion, irrational generosity, gratitude, and then you have to have the hustle to support all that. And it's funny because I do think having been to the events and the and even Omez is a platform where you do feel that sense of like radical inclusion and it it strips away all the boundaries that we know it's like I watch my children play and my children play with other kids they just run up to them on the playground and start playing with them right and can you imagine as an adult like running up to someone being like hi let's be friends you want to play let's do this right um, at some point we lose that and so the these environments that you both have created promote that um, and it's such a beautiful thing. I think before we go forward, I'd love to open up the floor for a few questions and then we'll round it out with one last sort of moment uh, and then we'll be finished. Does anyone have a question they want to ask? Guys, don't be shy. You guys Radical are entrepreneurs. What you don't want is you don't want to leave here and be like, oh my God, I should have asked that question. And you're going to be bummed out about it. So throw up your hand and just yeah. ask it and just go for it. We got one in the back. Uh, cool. I mean, maybe you guys, Shannon, you want to mention what make, what brings you to our event or any event or Ryan, what brings you to an event? Yeah, I mean, I think... <clears throat> The attraction is really that for the entrepreneur themselves, right? Which is how can they add value to this community, right? Like, and what can the community give back in terms of being there to really learn and sort of not just as a way to like shake hands or, you know, sort of what Ryan was talking about when you put yourself first, right? When, or sorry, when you put the other person first, right? And it's sort of like, what are you about? How do you think? What makes you you? And then how are you bringing that into the environment? Those entrepreneurs, the types that come, have a genuine connection to Roman. They have a genuine connection to the community and to, you know, so in this case, if, if you're sort of aspiring in that way to have that kind of thing, you then would sort of, it would be about what are you sort of standing for you know, why should they spend their time with you, right? What does that relationship look like? And as entrepreneurs and as, you know, growth people, right, we're always looking at, like, how do we expedite growth? How do we accelerate? But we're really in a business of relationships. We're not in a business of transactions. So invest your time in the relationship and creating value there, and you just might see that happen on the other end of that yeah. would be what I would say. Yeah, I, I just want to add on to that real quick and then we'll jump over because I have two thoughts. One is I was talking to someone yesterday and they were talking about events that they want to go to always come down to three things. Um, what is the content that's being presented at the event? Who's the community of people that's going to be in attendance at the event? And what's the space like? Is it a cool space? Mm -hmm. And so what attracted me to Roman and to, and to Worlds and Patau has been they always do top-notch content. It's always really sort of cutting-edge stuff that's very interesting where you leave feeling as though you learned a lot and it challenges you to think about who you are as a person. 
the community is an incredibly warm community of people where no one feels like they're the VIP. Everybody feels like a VIP. Um, and that's and that's one of those things where, you know, the either the fish rots from the head or the community gets lifted up from the head and, and Roman really sets that tone. So everybody feels like they're included and part of that. And then the last thing is the space. And we were just talking about it backstage. Shannon was talking about how when you go to a, a Worlds or a Patau, you're like you're stepping into a, an immersive environment that is that is hitting on all of your senses and really opening you up, opening you up so that you're excited about the um, about that content and about the community, and you just leave feeling jazz. So, so I'd take that into account when you're thinking about what you're doing. But the other thing I'd take into account is what was your name, uh, gentleman? Uh, Vlad. Vlad. And uh, how many, like roughly, how many founders do you have working for uh, coming to your events? We have about 70 okay. So awesome. That's incredible. I, you know, I don't know if you're going to say like 10 or 12, which would have been great, but 70 to 100. Now, what I would say very quickly is think about who are the entrepreneurs that you would like to be part of that community and then start thinking, what do they want? Like, what are they trying to serve? So if you have one day a month, all of these 70 to 100 founders or whatever portion of them show up going up to serve some cause, find the entrepreneurs that you want to go help. Find out what causes they're most passionate about and call them up and say, look, I've got 70 to 100 and incredibly talented CEOs, founders who not only want to give back and show up to help a cause, but it would really mean a lot to them if they could help your cause. And all we would like from you is to just share your lessons, some lessons with this group and why you care about that cause. And then all of a sudden they're part of your group and then just keep doing that and keep doing that. And that's a, and that's a way that you're not reaching out to these entrepreneurs thinking, how can they play a role in your community? You're saying, I have this community. How can they serve the people that you're trying to, that you're trying to include? Yeah, and just a quick shout to Justin and Thomas. Um, we all have stuff to do on a Saturday. <laughs> um, but the reason that we're here is we're here to serve. Like, we're here to give you guys the tools to be able to leave today and live a better life. And if we did that, that's all that we need. And so I think if you're able to do that for others, that, that's valuable. Sorry, there was, I, I don't mean to interrupt, but <laughs> We've got a lot of like type A people up here. It's like, yeah, what can I do for you? How can I help? Go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> Coming down from Silicon Valley, San Francisco, uh, having an exit of a, of a software company now in LA, uh, trying to understand the landscape. In SF, we're all in Soma. There's tons of founders and money everywhere. LA, there's not a, I've been found since I've been here, a center of like-minded like folks. Uh, how does one go about here in this market, um, finding that, um, seeking that out um, to build um, what we're doing now, our next venture? So worlds in Patel. No. <laughs> Brian, um, start. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I built in LA. Like, just look at the resources that right now are talking regularly about the businesses that are coming up in LA. So built in LA is one of those resources. SoCal Tech is one of those resources. There, you know, there, there are always these things like Thursday nights is another gathering of entrepreneurs. So there are a lot of different things that are pulling together entrepreneurs across a number of different businesses. Um, once you st I start with like, built in LA, like I have no affiliation to them other than I know that I get the emails and they're always trying to give a look across what are all the different businesses in SoCal LA and what are they up to. Silicon Beach is obviously a term that, that is widespread, but if you start looking it up, you're going to find other businesses. Um, but then it's going to come down to what is it that you're interested in within those? Is it just meeting as many entrepreneurs as possible or is there a specific sector that you're keenly interested in? The other thing is every city has three to six recruiters that are like the main recruiters for the tech center. Um, there are a couple of those here. Um, I actually think that I heard someone from Sapphire was here, Sapphire, Jim Jonason. There are a couple of those guys and women who are the top recruiters in LA. Call them up and sit down with them and just say that you want, or get five minutes on a, on a call and say you want as much of a landscape and they'll be able to tell you very quickly where those hubs are. And then you start with those hubs and go from there. Is that helpful? Two minutes. Okay, so we don't have very much longer to go. So one last thing. If you could leave all these lovely folks in the room with one piece of advice, um, what would it be? You, Roman. St you start. Me? Oh, Ryan can what? go, but if you want to. I right. feel like you've got so much wisdom. I have so much advice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Who wants to have coffee? Um, no. Okay, I'll start. Um, I think it's that 
ultimately, whatever you're buying or you're selling or you're trying to aggregate to sell or if it's product service, always remember there are human beings on the other side of whatever that is. And that human beings have emotions and feelings and they're not just about how can I get your emotions and feelings and then make money off of them. Um, people want to have a relationship and we're here at a growth summit, but growth doesn't just mean growth hacking and acquisition. It means what are the, what's the experience you're developing for whatever it is that you're creating and always stay humble and in service of that. Um, I was working on a campaign uh, that Omaze did with Star Wars and we had a chance to sit down with J.J. Abrams, um, who's the director of Star Wars, and, and his wife, Katie McGrath, and they're just an incredibly interesting, creative, brilliant, genius couple. And he said this thing, and he was just saying it sort of off the cuff, but he said, for a story to truly be great, the protagonist has to have something that they want to have happen with every fiber of their being, and a very clear tragedy that will result if it doesn't. And that's sort of the basis for, uh, for every movie. And if you think about it, on every, every movie that you want, every movie that you watch that you fall in love with, you're following some, someone on their hero's journey where there's something that they want to have happen with every fiber of their being and a clear tragedy that will result if it doesn't. What I believe is that if you take that and you apply it to your own life, then you can really tease out what your higher purpose in life is. Just asking yourself, what's the thing that you most hope for and what's the thing that you most fear? And usually those things end up being flip sides of the same coin. And then if you really get into how are those things, how is your hope serving you and how is your fear serving you, and then peel back the layers from the big broad statements, you know, my fear is failure. Well, what is failure? Define it. My, my hope is health and happiness and wellness and success. All right, well, define that. What's that mean? And once you start getting into what are the definitions of both sides of that and what is your higher purpose, and that's going to give you a bit of a North Star for what you want to do with your time, what you want to do with your day, and what other people want to do. You can find that out from other people and help them in the process. And rather than just go out and try and launch a business that's going to be super successful and make a ton of money but doesn't actually connect with you in your heart, your soul, try and figure out those things of what are you, what's your higher purpose in life and then that's going to wake you up every single morning and get you out of bed and, and keep you revved up and excited. And you're going to know you're spending your time in a, in a worthwhile way. Roman, close us out. Um, so my, my, my mom was kind of like the matriarch of the family. And she um, kind of supported the family in a lot of ways. And my dad always had these great ideas that never happened. He had always these dreams and that they never happened. And so through that, I, was, I saw that and I was like, oh, I can't like, have these big ideas. So I was like afraid to dream. And I think yeah, that kept me pretty small for a long time. And then I started to meet these other people where I'm like, the way that my dad lived his life is different than a lot of other people because you're a belief system of your family. But there's all these other people outside of your world that you can look up to. And what I learned from them is that you have to dream big. And uh, the only advice I have is probably two things. One is dream big. Imagine your greatest dream. And once you see that and you have to visualize it, because you know how people say, like, oh, I'll believe it when I see it? Well, it's actually the opposite. You have to see it first to believe it. Jim Quickline. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so once you visualize that dream, make that dream 10 times bigger and go after that dream. And to Ryan's point, he had a newsletter called How to Find Your Ikigai. And your Ikigai is a Japanese term uh, for finding your a higher calling. Uh, what your purpose in life is. And so your ikigai is your, what, it's your reason for being. And so sometimes it also kind of reflects what your destiny is. And so to identify what your destiny is, ask yourself these two things. One, what is your greatest joy? What makes you, like Ryan said, what makes you come alive? And then think about what is your unique greatest skill and talent? Combine that with what you think the world needs the most. What's the world's great? We're all like snowflakes of people, so we all have a different perspective on what the world needs. I think the world needs unity. That's why I bring this community together. Whatever you think the world needs and your greatest joy and deepest talent, find that and just dream as big as you can, and then you're definitely going to achieve your success as long as you put your hustle in. I think we're out of time. Um, thank you both. Amazing. Um, we've talked a lot about Worlds. Worlds, again, is happening September 10th and 11th in Long Beach. There's a lot more of this kind of amazing content and mentoring and connections and experiences um, that I hope that you will all come and share. 
um, with all of us. So thank you for your time and for your energy, and we appreciate it all. Thank you.